Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We um, are asking you to put your, if you haven't already, put your name and your location in chat and uh, let us know why you're joining us tonight, what's your main interest in healthcare, and we'll get rolling. We um, are recording now. Great. Thank you, DW, for pushing that button. I just want to say <clears throat> that, um, our, as you know, our legislative goal is State uh, Senate Bill 5, uh, 5399. And this bill just passed the Senate. Now it's onto the House. And we could really use our effective lobbyist to go to bat for our bill there. Um, so we also have a fundraising goal tonight and we're putting it at a reasonable $500. So can you help us get there? Just go to our website, click on the donate button. It's that easy. And please consider making a recurring donation to um, help us sustain our operations. Well then, without further ado, we'll start off and we'll start with um, Sherry Weinberg who will talk about the bill in question, our, our goal, 5399, the Universal Healthcare Commission bill. Take it away, Sherry. Okay, <clears throat> uh, Senate bill 5399, um, which is passed the Senate and is now in the health uh, care committee in the house. Um, it is a follow-up of the universal health care work group that existed from the middle of 2019 until January of this year. And that work group of which I was a member as was Ronnie and I'm not sure who else that's, who's on this call. Um, its task was to take a look at the whole situation and come up with recommendations. And it recommended ultimately as its first choice, but not, not much more than a good majority, um, a, uh, essentially a single payer system run by the state to have the healthcare authority uh, take on the responsibility of funding uh, health coverage for every single person who lives in Washington state. Um, so this bill, 5399, sets up a universal health care commission, which sounds redundant, but it isn't. Uh, this commission would be charged specifically with writing a system to uh, put in the legislature and get it passed and to make it be run by the health care authority, et cetera. And so it's, it would be the job of the UHCC to answer all the difficult questions and to go chasing the federal funding that is absolutely essential um, if you wanna make it affordable. Uh, we have to corral the, all the federal funding and it's large that comes into our state. So we are very enthusiastic about it. And if you have a, a, want to contact a legislator uh, about it, the biggest thing to say is, are we going to let the work of the Universal Healthcare Work Group go to waste? This is the next step to getting us to what we all think we want, which is everybody covered, everybody in, nobody out. Um, the second bill that um, is my bailiwick to watch for is uh, was also in the Senate, Senate Bill 5204. Um, and it is sponsored by the whole Washington group. Um, and that bill is written essentially like the Washington Health Security Trust, which those of you who've been around for a while will remember that we wrote 20 years ago and we're never able to get it through as an initiative. And it has been dropped in each legislative session since about 2009. Um, but whole Washington's um, proponents are trying to get, uh, get it, it approved straight up rather than going through a universal healthcare commission. Um, but actually the best time for both the, the WIST and the um, 5204 will be after 5399 is passed and the UHCC is set up, then 
um, th those two choices will make their job easier to create a system to be run by the state. Uh, so that's, and, but that bill is going nowhere. So it's officially still in the legislature, but it um, won't be anywhere until possibly um, next year. Um, okay, so next um, is Ash. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll unmute myself. Hello all, welcome to today's session. Thank you for joining in. I'm Asha Shidaran. I will be presenting the bill SSB 5068. So before we get into the details of the bill, I wanted to give a background of where it came from. So in Washington state and nationally, the maternal mortality rates, as you know, um, are exceptionally high. Um, and it is higher than most developed countries. So national and state mater maternal mortality data uh, kind of reveals that there is a significant disparity in the postpartum deaths. Over 50% of the pregnancy related deaths in Washington states are women enrolled in Medicaid. And nationally, mothers of color are two to three times more susceptible and in Washington state, especially our Native Americans and are six to seven times more susceptible to maternal mortality deaths. And there is a CDC finding that pregnancy related deaths occur up to one year postpartum. And the data shows that health needs continue during the entire year. So majority of the maternal mortality is preventable if funding and access to postpartum care and support through the entire first year after the pregnancy is made available by the government. So that is exactly what this bill is going to or supposed to be done if it passes through. It's an act to expand the medical assistance coverage for postpartum persons from 60 days following the end of a pregnancy to one year after the end of a pregnancy. And it ensures that all persons approved for the pregnancy and postpartum coverage through Medicaid in Washington at any time are continuously eligible for the postpartum coverage for 12 months after the pregnancy ends, regardless of whether they experience um, a change in income or any other circumstances during the period of eligibility. And the bill number again is SSB 5068. And uh, it was introduced in January this year and passed through multiple stages with so much of support. And uh, it's a bipartisan bill and there were not much of a position from anyone um, uh, during the hearings. And also it was backed up by physicians community significantly. It kind of shows the importance of this bill. So today was the public hearing in the House Committee on Healthcare and Wellness. Um, a remote testimony is still open and it is open until tomorrow morning. So in case if you feel strongly uh, about the cause of this bill, I will urge you to go ahead and submit a testimony remotely if possible before uh, the hearing ends tomorrow. Also, you can support our work, like Sherry said, and uh, as uh, per today's goal, you can support our work by going to our website and the donate a page by making a contribution in any amount. Thank you so much. And I will pass on to Marsha to present the next bill. Thank you, Ash, that's great. Yes, and I want to announce and emphasize that we will have a question and answer period um, at the end of um, the presentations. So um, please put your questions at any time into chat and then we'll um, cover those at the end of the, um, all the bills today. So I am gonna talk about um, the Senate Bill 5377. It also passed um, the Senate last week. Uh, this bill um, is addressing the affordability of the standardized plans that are um, on the um, exchange, they're sold on the exchange. So uh, this bill had bipartisan support. 
when Ann Rivers voted for it. She's from the 18th legislative district, um, battleground around La Center, around there in the southwest corner of the state. And um, she's a, a Republican. So this bill is also now in the House Healthcare and Wellness Committee. It's waiting for a hearing there to be called up for a public hearing. But what it does, this bill applies to individuals that are purchasing insurance on the health benefit exchange on the, uh, uh, in our state under one of the silver or gold um, standardized plans, which are also known as public option plans. And the, that, um, uh, this, um, it sets up a premium assistance program and a possible cost sharing assistance to help with co-pays and deductibles for individuals with incomes up to 500% of the federal poverty level. The current um, subsidies from the federal government go only up to 400% of the federal poverty level. So this um, subsidy would be uh, uh, in addition to any federal subsidies that this individual would be qualified for. Um, it's subject to the availability of funds, meaning um, it's, it's um, not set in stone what the amount would be of the subsidy, but first the bill has to pass and then you know, to see what, what the budget holds um, at the end of the session. Um, so this um, also establishes network participation requirements in the standardized plans for certain hospitals, um, making sure that the hospitals, there's good coverage throughout the state in every county. Um, it's an improvement on the original Cascade Care Bill. They, that's why it's called Cascade Care 2.0 in um, popular usage. Um, it simplifies insurance plans on the exchange by requiring carriers to offer the standardized plans that are designed by the exchange and limiting the number of non-standardized plans a, a carrier can offer. Um, a really cool part of this bill is that it directs the exchange to apply for federal waivers to help fund the subsidies. And then it also creates a healthcare affordability account in the state treasury dedicated to hold the funds for the premium and cost sharing programs. So why is it important to Healthcare for All Washington? Well, it helps people who are priced out of and struggling to access healthcare now until we can set up a comprehensive, universal, publicly funded and administered healthcare system in our state. Um, there are half a million Washington residents right now that are uninsured and others can't afford to use what um, insurance they have purchased. Um, with some families paying up to 30% of their income for health coverage, SB 5377 addresses the income, racial, and age disparities made so apparent during the pandemic. Um, this healthcare uh, affordability account would be a public fund that is dedicated for healthcare expenses. Um, and then another benefit of this bill would be it would bring down overall healthcare costs by steering individuals to the more cost-effective standardized plans and would ensure greater accountability and oversight of plans as well. So that's a thumbnail sketch of this um, bill. And we're just, um, we would want the action to be to let your uh, legislators know that uh, you support this kind of action as a temporary, well, as a measure that will go into effect and help people now until we can get the 5399 passed and get a, uh, a universal plan established in our state. So thank you. And remember to put your questions in chat. I will, I will hand off now to Consuelo, who's going to talk about the next bill, Consuelo. Hi, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Hi, my name is Consuelo Echeverria, and I'm new to Healthcare for a Human Right, and I'm learning a ton about how bills are passed. They are incredibly patient, answering my multitude of questions. Um, I truly believe that healthcare is a human right, which is why I got involved. And I'm here to talk about a bill that I personally am very passionate about though it sounds kind of geeky, concerning health, trans health systems transparency, 1272. And it's important for, I think, five different reasons. First of all, it requires hospitals and clinics to report their revenue and operating costs, including salaries, 
So we really get an understanding of what the true cost of healthcare is. It also protects patients from unexpected billing. So for non-emergency services. So if you are referred to a clinic that's outside of the campus, they have to tell you whether your insurance covers it or not. It also protects the health of our nursing staff because it will force um, hospitals to create shift-based nurse staffing plans that enabled registered nurses to take meal and rest breaks, which sometimes as we know with COVID, it's been impossible for them to do. And finally, it, disag it I'm, I'm getting tongue tied here. <laughs> um, it requires that patient data be disaggregated including mortality rates to really understand the true disparities in access to healthcare in vulnerable communities. And what I mean by that, for example, is that I work with refugee and immigrant communities in South Seattle doing health literacy program. And we know that there's a huge difference between an African-American born in the United States as accessing healthcare and a Somali who doesn't speak very good English accessing healthcare so through the disaggregation of this kind of data, we will get a clearer understanding of where these disparities lie. So the bill has just been scheduled on March 19th for a public hearing on the Senate Committee on Health and Long-Term Care. Please go to your legislative board and support PRO or, or testify in support until we can get, can get 5399 passed. And uh, also, I just wanted to mention that as anybody knows, anybody in Port Orchard or folks in Port Orchard, please ask them to thank uh, Representative Michelle, and I'm going to mispronounce her name, Caldere. Marsha, how do you pronounce her name? Caldere, I don't know how to pronounce uh, it. I think it's Caldere. Caldere, okay. Um, who's been the only Republican to support this bill in the House uh, Health Care Committee. So it's, I think it's really important at this point that we reach across the aisle and that we thank representatives who are Republicans for supporting health care for all. And finally, please support our work by going to our donate page and making contributions in any amount. Thank you. And I believe Ronnie is next in line. Thanks, Consuela. Uh, I'm Ronnie Shore, and I'm a retired pharmacist. I've worked in uh, public health, mental health, uh, substance abuse programs for vulnerable vulnerable populations, and and I've moved into healthcare for all Washington and joined the board really to continue that relationship, uh, and uh, with patients and with moving uh, the action forward. The bill I'm talking about is 5203, which is about prescription drug purchasing and distributing and actually manufacturing. Uh, other states uh, like us are looking at ways to set up the structure to uh, be prepared when universal health care does become available. And this is one of the perfect tools to pull together actions that the, uh, uh, our state has in the background. Uh, we have some great evidence-based practice and pharmacy and therapeutics committees that are supporting uh, our Medicaid program and our public employees insurance program. And, and we are really uh, using this bill to align ourselves with the future of universal healthcare coverage. And the one part about manufacturing is that there are generic drugs that are still really expensive. Uh, biosimilars like insulin, uh, a lot of different types of insulin are not on patent anymore. And it can, manufacturing can occur. And Washington state has technological background and we, we just need to start lining ourselves up now. So 5203 is an effort to do that. It has passed the, the Senate and we don't have a date for hearing in the healthcare and wellness committee in the house. But as soon as that comes up, keep, be aware, we really want to support that. And uh, it will be a difficult 
issue for many people to understand, but it puts Washington State in position to take advantage of uh, the next step that comes along. So if you have questions, certainly put those in chat. Uh, and I have been adding the website for Healthcare for All Washington. So go into the chat and click on that for a second, just to save that to your desktop. And, uh, and now I'm gonna hand it uh, off to Elaine Cox, who will talk about the next bill. So if I you wanna unmute yourself. Yeah, hello. Um, happy to be with you all tonight. And I've been with Healthcare for All for about two years now. And uh, my background is in uh, healthcare. I was an occupational therapist. I practiced in both Canada and the US. So I've seen the single payer side of healthcare from a provider perspective and also from the US side. So that's been a really interesting journey. And um, I've also worked uh, in health services research with Medicaid in Massachusetts. Um, and I just wanna put a plug in for volunteering with Healthcare for All Washington. It's a really great organization to work with. The people are fantastic. And it's been a really rewarding experience working with them. Um, I also edit the uh, e-bulletin. I don't know if you guys see that, um, but please, you know, check it out. Um, you can see it on our web page under the resources tab. Okay, so I'm here to talk about um, the, let's see, how do I say this? Uh, engrossed second substitute bill 5052 that was passed out of the Senate uh, this uh, recently. This this is a bill relating to creation of health equity zones. And uh, while we at Healthcare for Washington support you know, universal health care as a way to achieve health equity, we understand that the great importance that social determinants of health play in our overall health and the importance of supporting work that um, builds further on health equity. So that's kind of why we're supporting this bill. The bill itself um, requires the Department of Health to uh, designate health equity zones statewide and develop projects that meet the needs of each zone. And it allows communities to self-identify as a health equity zone and develop projects. So this is really uh, an attempt to empower communities to identify themselves um, as having um, health inequities and uh, tell the state what they need in order to uh, rectify their health inequities. So it's kind of a really bottom up approach to this issue. Um, and the, uh, the bill uh, does not have um, any funding yet. It says uh, it's subject to funding. <laughs> So they, they, they're just kind of creating a, a possibility for providing uh, projects, uh, grant funds to uh, health equity communities so that they can undertake uh, projects such as, um, let's see, chronic infectious diseases, maternal birth complications, preterm births, that uh, projects of that nature to support those activities in those communities. Um, so this uh, bill was sponsored by Senator Kaiser. It got uh, some good support in the Senate. It's going over to the House and uh, there is a hearing in the House Wellness Committee, Healthcare and Wellness Committee on March 15th at 1.30 p.m. And I would encourage anyone who uh, you know, I would encourage all of you to go in and s at least uh, sign in pro to this bill. Uh, well, no, that's not ready quite yet, but um, to, uh, you know, testify or, uh, you know, sign in to support this bill. Um, I feel like there was something else I wanted to say, but it's gone now. So, um, 
I encourage everyone to please support our work. Um, go to the donate page and make your contribution there. And I'm going to turn it over to Ash now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elaine. And I just realized I did not introduce myself. <laughs> so um, my background is very different. I do not have a background in healthcare. Um, my background is software engineering. I was a software project manager. Um, I uh, decided to um, engage with healthcare for all because I strongly care for um, addressing the health di healthcare disparities which exist in this country. Um, and Healthcare for All Washington has been a amazing group of people who is working tirelessly and uh, to support the bills which really take care of those gaps. So it's been a wonderful experience for me. I joined the team last year. So this is a little bit about me before I get into the bill. So next bill, which I'm going to talk about is HB 1000. Um, it is still in the early stages. So we this is a bill which we would like to support. It is still in the early stages. So I will give you like an overview of the bill and then probably we'll move on to the next bill. So what this bill does is it, it's a bill which is created for expanding the mental health support for the law enforcement officers in Washington state. And what it does is it mandates a three pilot projects to support the behavioral health improvement and suicide prevention efforts for law enforcement officers to be funded through grants made available to law enforcement associations and agencies. We think it's very important because it addresses the behavioral health training uh, needed by the law enforcement officers in order to save other lives. And um, um, it is still in the house for appropriation. Fiscal notes are available, but it hasn't moved um, further. So I would urge everybody, if you again feel um, strongly with the cause, to, to reach out to your legislators and ask for their support on this bill. Thank you. And I will pass it on to Marcia to present the next bill. Great, thanks Ash. Um, I wanna make sure, okay. Um, so the last bill on our, our docket today is um, Senate Bill 5020. This is the bill that um, would um, uh, apply a penalty on unsupported prescription drug price increases. This bill is sponsored by Karen Kaiser, Senator Kaiser, and it hasn't moved um, beyond the ways, hasn't been scheduled for um, movement beyond the Ways and Means Committee. Um, so it probably will not advance this session, but what it would do it would be to, there's a list of unsupported drug prices maintained by the ICER um, group of, um, of study group. And anything flagged on that report would be uh, have, subject to filing a report with the state of Washington to support those drug price high increases. And if, a if the company did not file that report, they would be subject to a fine. And if they did file the report and the price was found to be not supported by, by the, any improvements in the drug, then that, uh, there would be, the penalty would be equal to 80% of the difference between the supported price and the unsupported price. So it's a way to um, get drug companies, pharmaceutical manufacturing companies to be responsive to the actual prices of their drugs and the price, lower the price increases that have been happening across so many drugs lately. So that one is um, a wish list, but it's probably not going to advance um, this session. Uh, at this point now, I'd like to pass the baton over to Peter Lucas, and I find, I didn't identify myself either, but I am Marcia Stedman, <laughs> and I'm president of Healthcare for All Washington. I just want to say it's been a really delight, delightful experience to have all the support I've had from the board members and from the volunteers that you're hearing from tonight. So just want to thank everybody for their work and uh, for being in this fight together. Thank you. 
And Peter, can we hear from you now? He's the chair of our fundraising committee. Thank yeah, you, Peter. I can, yeah. I'm, I'm Peter Lucas. I'm a, a practicing physician um, and I've been on the board for several years now. And as Marcia mentioned, I'm chair of fundraising. As if you hadn't heard already, we, we hope to raise a little money tonight, maybe more than a little money. And um, as you know, over 500,000 Washingtonians are still without health insurance. And uh, we know that in this year, second year of the pandemic, having affordable universal health care is especially critical. And it's a moral imperative. And we think that we, at Healthcare for All, are positioned to make a real difference as we have previously. And you've heard some of the ways we are, we are making a difference. Uh, we were instrumental in the passage of the bill that led to the creation of the Universal Healthcare Work Group. And several of our members, as Sherry mentioned, were appointed to the work group and successfully advocated for a single payer system. Uh, in the last legislative session, 2020, our insulin bills had significant support from Republicans, due in part to our lobbyists' amazing ability to find common ground across political parties. And uh, her skills and dedication were critical to the passage of, of the various bills that got passed in the last couple of legislative sessions. Unfortunately, we had to let her go in December due to a funding shortfall brought about by the pandemic and um, economic short cash, uh, uh, problems and the election. So while we are frugal and able to achieve much through our board members, volunteers, and part-time communications director, we could be even more effective with additional paid staff members, such as our lobbyists. So please, if you haven't heard it already, please go to our webpage, please donate. We especially appreciate recurring monthly donations. Thank you. Ronnie, will you give us a tour of the website, a brief tour here, and then we'll go uh, into Let's take a answer. tour. So I think we've all told you that there is a, 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 an easy way to donate uh, using credit cards, or we actually have our address in here as well uh, to, if you want to just mail a check in, uh, there is a button to click for monthly donations to make that a monthly donation. It doesn't usually blink, but I'm trying to make it blink. Uh, and uh, we have a tax deductible uh, wing uh, with a education newsletter that comes out quarterly. Uh, Sherry Weinberg uh, edits that uh, that uh, quarterly uh, newsletter, and we've already had comments when we first started about how much you all love that. Uh, so you can give donations to either our regular C4 account or our special uh, deductible education fund. Uh, and you can send in any amount and, and, and every little bit does help. Uh, let me take you back to a couple of areas. We're talking about legislation tonight uh, and there is an icon at the top uh, to identify the legislation. You can see some written descriptions of each of the bills that we've been talking about tonight. And this is where you could find some updated information about those bills. Uh, we have uh, some information about state-based universal health care uh, laws that are actually being reintroduced nationally. Uh, as Alan mentioned uh, about the current bill that was passed today uh, about Medicare, uh, there are state-based universal health care bills that are introduced from time to time. And you can find that in a number of different places, including on our legislative spot, uh, our legislative page. Uh, there is a volunteer page. Uh, just clicking on the get involved gives you some different information and updates uh, and a page on volunteering. Uh, and certainly most of the work this has my name on it, but uh, when you open it up, it should have your name or an opportunity or a place to enter your name. And while most of the events we're doing are virtual now, we're coming to a turning point where we may have some small group events in the future. We would love to have your help 
with legislative issues, either you know, lobbying your legislature, legislator, uh, testifying, uh, watching for alerts from us to do that, but also helping us organize and, and run meetings like this. If you have skills in that, we'd love to get you involved. And it, there, are, there are so many people that will say, yes, I agree with this aspect or that aspect, but there's still confusion out there. So volunteering to speak uh, doesn't mean you have to be an expert uh, in healthcare policy, it means you have to know the basics and help us build relationships with people to move that forward. And did I tell you that there's a button that you could push to make a donation? I think I did tell you that. Uh, but let me close just reminding you that that is available and uh, we certainly would welcome your participation there. So I'm going to stop sharing that, uh, and uh, we would love to have uh, any questions or answers. Uh, if you came in at a point and we might have just discussed the bill you are interested in, please add that to the Q and A uh, section. Uh, and uh, if not, uh, you know, it, it, we can uh, maybe get started. Uh, and I think our priority is with 5399. So Sherry, can I ask you uh, a specific question about that bill? And maybe you could unmute yourself and, and, yes. and talk about that. Uh, there's a pathway, uh, the, the pathway bill that helped create the work group or universal healthcare work group. Uh, and some lessons came out of that of how, what we need to do to get to universal single payer coverage. Uh, and this bill 5399 uh, does talk about some of those steps uh, and it's discouraging. A lot of people have uh, thrown up their hands saying, you know, we can't wait, we need it now. But uh, could you uh, maybe walk us through a couple of the key steps that 5399 lays out Okay, well, the most important step, um, by the way, the bill is largely drafted from uh, one page in Appendix I of the um, report from the Universal Healthcare Work Group that gave a timeline. And the first thing would, would on it was for the legislature to pass an intention statement, which is at the beginning of the bill, and to set up a universal healthcare commission to put together a group of people who would be charged with uh, writing a, an actual plan that, that could be implemented. Um, and there are several steps to that. The first is um, setting up an administrative structure to run the plan. And that's where uh, the uh, WIST or Washington Health Security Trust Bill comes in. We've already done that work. It's not rocket science to create an administrative um, body to run a, uh, a, a healthcare financing system and to organize um, things like what is going to be covered, uh, how is it going to be paid for, what kinds of uh, medical practitioners are going to be included, uh, negotiating with those uh, uh, practitioners for inclusion, uh, setting payment rates. Uh, so there's that kind of administrative work. There's also setting up some advisory committees um, to help the uh, commission with how to, uh, and on an ongoing basis, to help the plan to stay up to date. What do you do with a, a new drug or a new procedure? Uh, when should it become part of the um, coverage system and, and when is it too experimental? Um, never mind, uh, what do you do with things that are pretty far out, like um, iridologists, people who read your healthcare by looking at the irises of your eyes? for example. We heard from all of these folks, by the way, back in 1993, 
when we had the Health Services Act that was set and busy setting up a system before the Republicans axed the whole thing in 1995. But I was at some of the hearings and I heard from uh, people I didn't know existed. I mean, types of providers that I didn't know existed. Um, but the, then there are big ones um, like uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act is the law, the federal law of the land, and we would have to get waivers from the um, federal government, health, uh, health and human services, to be able to put our plan into place, and most important, to get all the federal funds that come in for uh, Medicare, for Medicaid, for the VA, <clears throat> for military families, um, and, and the like, uh, Indians, uh, the Indian Health Service. If we're going to have a universal system that covers everybody, we have to be able to put all that federal money into the pot that is then used to um, pay, even though additional state fund would be needed instead of individual people having to pay premiums and, and deductibles and co-pays and all of that, we would have to raise some tax money in our state to take care of that. And that often um, puts people off. Oh my God, you're gonna raise my taxes. Yeah, but how about taking away the fact that you have to pay health insurance premiums and co-pays and deductibles and all that. Um, would you rather, uh, would you be willing to trade that in for some higher taxes? So anyway, those are all the kinds of jobs that the um, uh, Universal Health Care um, Commission would do. The law includes very specifically um, eight members of the legislature, seven different um, department heads or, or um, uh, different agencies of government who all have, have to be involved in running a healthcare system. And then eight uh, people who are supposed to be drawn from the general public looking for uh, expertise in how to, how to run a, a healthcare system and how to uh, design it. And specifically uh, to include somebody from uh, the tribes, from at least one person for representing uh, Indian tribes. And then they're supposed to put all, it all together to come up with recommendations and there are 12 of them. So I won't read it, but it's basically mo most of the things that I've mentioned already. Uh, and then they're supposed to uh, give that to the legislature. Now the, the law, the, if 5399 passes as is, it gives the commission up until uh, late in 2024 to come up with their report. Um, the trouble with that is, first of all, I don't think if we get this law passed this session, um, then the commission would go into effect by uh, this summer or early next fall, the fall of 2021. And they really don't need three years to do this. Um, it's complicated, but it's not that time intensive. Uh, and the advantage, I really strongly want them to cut it down to 2023. Why? Because then the resulting plan would go to the legislature in 2024 before we get into having an election in 2024, which could change things dramatically. And the plan, could go through the legislature in 2024 and be actually up and running by the beginning of 2025. If you delay it by a year, then it doesn't go before the legislature until 2025 when you have a new legislature and you have a new federal government maybe. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen by then. So I, I think it's worth it to, uh, to have just the election of 20 and not both 2022 and 2024 between the Universal Healthcare Commission and um, launching the program. So that's about more detail than anybody would want, but 
<laughs> Thanks, Marsha. I think so. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Marsha, do you want to uh, take over from here or uh, talk about our next Zoom meeting for all? Or uh... Uh, no, I'm. Can you hear me now? Okay, so there was a question about from somebody about five three nine nine wanting to know if it was dead in the water in chat here. So I was wondering. Um, uh, I would like to have that be answered. Maybe I could just take a stab at that, which is no, it's not dead in the water. Um, it's very much alive. It passed the Senate and it's uh, now waiting to be heard in the House. And the action that we need from our supporters is to contact members of the healthcare committee in the House and urge them to uh, make sure that uh, it gets put on the docket for the healthcare and wellness, uh, House Healthcare and Wellness Committee. Um, I, I believe that we, are, we had some information in our uh, last action alert about that, or you can, um, uh, there's a way to co contact um, all the people on the healthcare committee. You can also contact your own representatives in the house to urge that they, to, to let them know that you want this bill to be heard in the healthcare committee and would they do something to support it. Thank you. Um, so I think we're ne nearing the close of this um, that was the most burning question I saw in chat. I, were there any other questions that people saw uh, that are monitoring the chat for questions? I, I just have yes. to oh. check right now. Yeah, there's a couple more questions, check. Um, and I mean, what Sherry was talking about, I was just wondering, she was talking about how she wished the year could be uh, 23 as opposed to 24 to have the commission, you know, be done with the, the plan, but how can we change that right now if the bill is already written that way? Well, first of all, there, it would, the bill would have to be amended, but there will be plenty of opportunity for it to be amended as it works its way through the house. Um, so what you do is you go in and testify for, or you offer written testimony for the bill and you include that in your written testimony that yes you're first of all it's not that important we certainly wouldn't be against the bill if they don't change the date but you would say you're in favor of it but you think they the the um, commission can do its work by the end of 2023 and we need to get things going i would not include in my testimony concerns about future elections um, the, these people are politicians, they will figure that one out. But I would simply point out that it would be nice to get it sooner rather than, than wait another year. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Sherry, yes. And I saw another suggestion that um, timely action alerts are really helpful for our supporters. And so I, I urge um, you to watch your emails, supporters, because we do send out action alerts when there's when it's time to take action, and we do um, specify what the action is, and even give you some talking points, or and certainly some uh, links to find your legislators, so you can contact them easily by following um, our um, prompts in the action alerts. Um, and we have, uh, if you want to see our current action alert, just go to our website, and there's a. Uh, spot where it says current action alert on the top of our homepage in one of the tabs. It might be under the get involved. I think it's under the get involved tab. So I think if there are no further burning questions for tonight, we'll just say thank you for, to everyone for joining us tonight and to remind you that we do these every month on the second Wednesday in April. The second Wednesday in April is on April 14th. And we are really so pleased that we have a special guest speaker that night. His name is Dr. David Belk, and he will be speaking on the great American healthcare scam. What accounts for the high prices in healthcare and what can we do about them? So we hope you'll tune in um, on April 14th, join us at seven o'clock, and we'll be enlightened by Dr. David Belk talking about the true cost of healthcare and why it is so high. Thank you for joining us, everyone, and um, stay safe and healthy. <laughs>